Great Anarchist Number 7, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, by Ruth Kinna and Clifford Harper. Proudhon is famous for two reasons. First, he's the author of What is Property? The book containing the immortal phrase, Property is Theft. Second, he has emerged as the first anarchist. This accolade is explained in part by his provocative reclamation of anarchy. Until Proudhon published his critique of property in 1840, the term had only been applied pejoratively. His accolade as the first anarchist also stems from his encounter with Marx. In 1846, Proudhon rebuffed Marx's tentative advances and hinted that he found his proposals dogmatic. Proudhon died in 1865 and was not party to the disputes that led to the subdivision of the international socialist movement. Nevertheless, his early promotion of anarchy established him as the originator of the anti-authoritarian current that opposed Marxist socialism in the 1860s and 1870s. Proudhon's greatness is sometimes linked to his political economy and his advocacy of decentralised federation, namely organising from the bottom up and on the basis of free agreement or voluntary association. His federalist ideas were profoundly influential in 19th century left liberal and anti-authoritarian circles, notably in Spain, where anti-monarchist revolutionaries actively promoted Proudhonian principles from the late 1860s. During the same period, Proudhon was one of the best known social philosophers of the age, often compared to Kant and Hegel. His early admirers included Bakunin, who honoured Proudhon as the master of us all, and Alexander Herzen, Bakunin's compatriot and sometime friend. Editing a series of four papers in France during and after the 1848 revolution, Proudhon exercised an enormous influence on French workers, lending his name to a mass movement. Marx later heaped ridicule on Proudhon's economics and seemingly shaky grasp of Hegelian dialectics. His star plummeted as Marx's rose, and its re-ascendance was for many years frustrated by the paucity of English language translations of his work. Proudhon's designation as an individualist rather than communist anarchist, notably by his late 19th and early 20th century champion Benjamin Tucker, probably also slowed his rehabilitation. Most of all, Proudhon's reputation has been badly tarnished by his anti-Semitism and anti-feminism. Anarchists on both sides of the individual communist divide have expressed alarm at the depth of Proudhon's cultural prejudice and his adoption by some 20th century ultra-right and fascist groups. His professed anti-feminism is frequently described as misogynist. Proudhon regarded women's rights as an absolute demand incompatible with his social philosophy. As Louise Michel noted, the practical upshot of this vaunted position was that he classified women as either domestics or whores. Proudhon is not the only anarchist with a blemished record. He remains a great anarchist, not just because he bequeathed later activists a socio-political framework for the organisation of anarchy, but above all, because he outlined an approach to philosophy, science and sociology that pinned law and certainty to the idea that everything in social life is fluid and contingent. Proudhon gave anarchists decentralised federalism as an approach to pluralism and power, not as an organising principle. The philosophy of progress. Born in Besançon in 1809, Proudhon shared his birthplace with the utopian socialist Charles Fourier and the republican writer Victor Hugo. Yet he did not place himself in a Byzantine radical tradition or assume the mantle of either of the town's famous sons. Proudhon's thinking about the centrality of labour to social transformation picked up on a prominent theme in Fourier's utopian socialism, but he mocked Fourier's work when he first came across it in the late 1820s. Proudhon was more attuned to Hugo. His hostility to Napoleon III, which led to his arrest in 1849, was as fierce as Hugo's and similarly rooted in a critique of arbitrary rule. Nevertheless, while Proudhon regarded Hugo as a political ally, he considered that his own original contribution to human understanding lay in philosophy, not politics, specifically in his exposition of the philosophy of progress. Movement was Proudhon's core concept and it operated in two ways. Firstly, Proudhon argued that everything in nature and social life existed in a state of constant change. Planets, orders, people, practices, norms, thought, which he called reason, were all subject to movement. Second, movement established relations between things. It assumed that there were points of departure or principles and points of arrival or aims. 
describing movement as a law of existence, Proudhon argued that nothing that the law described, including reason, possessed fixed content. Nature, the individual, society were all perceptions, products of the imagination or what he called fictions. It was possible to describe and analyse them, but it was impossible to break them down into their component parts, either to discover their essence or deduce their ideal operating conditions. Nor was it possible to discover their ultimate cause. Cause or force was merely a property of movement which animated principles to realise aims. Proudhon set progress against the absolute and absolutism, referring to any notion of intransience. At a high level, this included theological conceptions of God, the derivative idea of obedience to a single sovereign. Movement spelt, he said, the negation of every immutable form and formula, of every doctrine of eternity, permanence, impeccability, and progress was, he said, the negation of every permanent order, even that of the universe, and of every subject or object, empirical or transcendental, which does not change. Proudhon's law unsettled the foundations of traditional philosophy, while recognising its ideational force and transformative potential. On one side of the equation, movement undermined notions of eternal power, original creation and superior will, and denied the existence of a perfect deity, against which humans were reckoned solid and imperfect. On the other, it affirmed God's creation through religious observance and declared God's becoming as a force for humanity's cultivation. Proudhon thus cleared the way for Bakunin's demand for God's abolition and Tolstoy's recognition of the kingdom of God within. Anticipating Foucault, Proudhon once remarked that he never reread his work and had forgotten most of what he had written. Unruffled by the prospect of critique, he wore his probable errors and inconsistencies as a badge of honour. Better to inspire others than push would-be followers to venerate texts or pour over them as to divine doctrine. System and systematising were to be deplored. Only absolutists insisted on perfection and staunch consistency. Moreover, the pursuit of the ideal was dangerous. It resulted in the confusion of conception with principle and development with existence, encouraging the prescription of models as permanent cures for everyone's ills. Proudhon detected absolutism in the centralisation of the ancien regime and equally in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's reflections on the human condition, human corruption and moral polity. He saw it in the bourgeoisie's consolidation of power in 1789 and the class advantages it subsequently anchored in the constitution. Vulgar philosophers typically associated progress with cumulative improvement, another kind of absolutism, variously assessed using measures of certainty, civility, equality, market expansion, technological advance and increased happiness. Proudhon embraced some of these phenomena but rejected the formulation of historical advance and the sciences it spawned. If absolutists applied philosophy as snake oil, the philosophy of progress was not a new brew. It was a critique that focused attention on the articulation of a positive science of the material world. Exchange and Economy Proudhon turned to sociology and political economy to investigate the nefarious effects of absolutism. His leading assumptions were first, that society emerged from human interaction and second, that labour was the basis of interaction. Society was an order of free exchange spontaneously constituted by the fluid relations and economic solidarity of all of the individuals of the nation, of the locality or corporation, or of the entire species. In society, individuals circulate freely, make approaches, join together and disperse in turn in all directions. Anarchy was the order of society and was natural and perfectible in this sense alone. As he said, society exists from the day that individuals, communicating by labour and speech, assume reciprocal obligations and give birth to laws and customs. Undoubtedly, society becomes perfect in proportion to the advances of science and economy. But at no epoch of civilization does progress imply any such metamorphosis as those dreamed of by the builders of utopia. And however excellent the future condition of humanity is to be, it will be nonetheless the natural continuation the necessary consequence of its previous positions. 
When society was made subject to absolutist principles, social relationships were invariably distorted and constrained. Proudhon focused on the regulatory systems introduced by social elites, namely capitalists and landowners, where property ownership was guaranteed as an exclusive right to highlight the effects on the economy. Production was geared towards profit, work was performed to exhaustion, technology was used destructively, land enjoyed as a marker of status, and taxation imposed as a cost to maintain the panoply of policing the system required. Proudhon's recommendations for a reform were extensive. The list included the abolition of rent and interest, the abandonment of credit, and the introduction of reciprocal exchange, the liquidation of debts and mortgages, and tax and tariff reform. This package of practical proposals described the theory of mutualism and Proudhon argued that its realisation would reduce the role of centralised government, rebalancing the power of society against the state. Mutualism dispensed with the plethora of coercive measures adopted to ensure the state's smooth functioning. It also facilitated democratisation, which Proudhon associated with anarchy, demanding social restructuring. This contestation of absolutism was progressive because it recovered transitory concepts from the static principles of political economy and pioneered a form of organisation robust enough to maintain the balance of forces active in society without over-prescribing rules of interaction. Proudhon's approach reversed the logic of recuperation. His conception approximated more closely to the idea of recovery from illness than to commodification or loss. Noting that principles of competition and monopoly were used by political economists to rationalise exclusivity, individual advantage and social disintegration, Proudhon maintained that these concepts were equally tools to advance liberty. Monopoly was only the autocracy of man over himself, he said, the dictatorial right accorded by nature to every producer of using his faculties as he pleases, of giving free play to his thought in whatever direction it prefers. Competition likewise, he said, was the expression of collective activity, productive of social solidarity. Distinguishing himself from absolutist reformers, notably Jacobins and old-time communists who dreamed of using the machinery of the state to bring exchange under the direct control of self-appointed benevolent elites, Proudhon denied that decentralisation and federation amounted to a system of government. Having witnessed Napoleon III's Caesarist manoeuvring and the success of the 1851 coup, He was alert to the vulnerability of the anarchist orders he championed. Unlike the state, society was necessarily plural and diverse. It achieved social harmony by allowing competing forces to act upon each other, not by inculcating unitary ideals. It was possible then to imagine an authoritarian charge against anarchy and the re-regulation of society by conservatives, zealots of laissez-faire liberalism or communists. Federalism was Proudhon's solution. It reinforced the equalities and solidarities that mutualism underwrote. Parties to the Federation entered into contracts to guarantee mutual care and well-being. This preserved individual sovereignty and rights while creating reciprocal obligations to ensure that progress, the railway of liberty, was protected from resurgent absolutist fantasies. Motors of change. Convention has it that war is productive of order. War made the state and the state made war and justice developed from the conflicts. Proudhon's modification of this relation preserved what he called the right of force, but tacked it to the law of movement and dispensed with the criteria of judgment victors habitually used to moralise the orders they established. Resurrecting the old warrior spirit to defend the right of force Proudhon recognised its debasement by the structural power advantages that states protected. There was no honour in the institutionalised civil wars owners waged against workers, or in the militarised international adventures they financed to further their economic interests. However, seeing force as an essential component of the law of movement, he believed that it animated competition and the interactions that stimulated unity without atrophy. In society, individuals exercised unequal force against each other and within the collectives they were members of in order to assert their individuality. Although their association was natural and spontaneous, human beings were not bees or ants. 
they did not occupy predetermined or stable roles within their associations. Indeed, human organisation assumed unsettled division and the differentiation of the individual from the whole. Individuals were socialised in society, but also exercised an independent force on it. There was an irreducible tension between the two. Force was the glue that held social relations in equilibrium. Social health was measured by the gentleness of the oscillations required to achieve equilibrium and social disease by the potency of the force required to maintain balance. Reviewing ancient society from this 19th century vantage point, Proudhon suggested that the moderns were more honest, livelier and equipped with a greater respect for rights, yet he refused to link justice to moral precept or standard. The concept of justice and the idea of moral law were supreme, but these two emerged from force and social struggle. Justice was the struggle for the sublime, the cultivation of perfection through art, politics, philosophy, music and physical prowess. Previous generations had wrongly created external standards of perfection, elaborated against humanity. Proudhon believed that perfection demanded the jettisoning of these idols and ideals. The deification of man progressed by imagination and invention. He said, Nothing remains for us to take. The tradition is exhausted. We are forced to become original in our turn and to continue the movement. These short introductions delve into the anarchist canon to recover some of the distinctive ideas that historical anarchists advanced to address problems relevant to their circumstances. Although these contexts were special, many of the issues the anarchists wrestled with still plague our lives. Anarchists developed a body of writing about power, domination, injustice and exploitation, education, prisons and a lot more besides. Honing in on different facets of the anarchist canon is not just an interesting archaeological exercise. The persistence, development and adaptation of anarchist traditions depends on our surveying the historical landscape of ideas and drawing on the resources it contains. The theoretical toolbox that this small assortment of anarchists helped to construct is there to use, amend and adapt. Agitate, educate, organise. Read by Barbara Graham and Jim Donaghy, Great Anarchist is a 10-part pamphlet series written by Ruth Kinna with artwork by Clifford Harper and published by Dog Section Press and Active Distribution in 2018-2019. The pamphlet's subjects are Peter Kropotkin, Voltairine de Clare, Michael Bakunin, Louise Michel, Oscar Wilde, Max Stirner, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, Lucy Parsons, William Godwin and Eric Malatesta. Visit dogsection.org or activedistribution.org to find out more and click the link to find our readings of the other pamphlets in the series.